section nine of the pearl fountain and other fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the pearl fountain and other fairy tales by bridget and julia cavanagh fairy and brownie there was once upon a time a poor old woman who lived in a little cottage on the borders of a forest with her two orphan grandchildren they were twin sisters and so much alike that their grandmother only knew them by the colour of their hair for one was fair and the other was dark and the fair one was called fairy and the dark one brownie the old woman went out one day to gather sticks in the forest and left the two children alone in the house it was a saturday and fairy who was looking out of the window to see the people who went up and down the road on the way to and from market also began to sing ding dong dell sang fairy and brownie answered with him pussy cats in the well who put him in sang fairy little johnny trim answered brownie who took him out fairy sang again and again brownie answered little johnny trout the two sisters were beginning again with ding dong dell when a little old gentleman turned round the corner of the house and looked up at fairy he wore a cocked hat and a red coat silk stockings and shoes with silver buckles to them for all this happened a long time ago when people were still dressed after that fashion my dear said the old gentleman winking at fairy how well you do sing will you let me in to listen to your ding dong dell the door is on the latch sir replied fairy and you can come in if you like oh very well says he briskly and in he walked at once fairy who was never afraid of anything or of any one came and looked at him but brownie who was shy ran and hid behind the door the old gentleman took a chair sat down and made himself comfortable presently he took off his cocked hat and said to fairy my dear your ding dong dell is the prettiest and the cleverest song i ever heard do sing it to me please in my right ear dear yes answered fairy but brownie must sing pussy cats in the well by all means said he brownie shall sing in my left ear fairy began at once with ding dong dell which she sang in the old gentleman's right ear and brownie sang pussy cats in the well in his left ear and they both sang till the song was ended when they began it again for as the old gentleman said one can never have too much of a good thing indeed so nicely did they sing and so pleased was he that he shut his eyes and purred like a cat they had just begun another ding dong dell when the door opened and their grandmother came in with her bundle of sticks there dears that will do thank you said the old gentleman getting up and walking out something fell on the floor with a chink as he got up and fairy ran after him saying you have dropped something sir keep it my dear answered the old gentleman without looking round he walked on very fast got behind some tall ferns and vanished when fairy went back to the cottage and told her grandmother all that had happened she found that it was a bright new shilling which the old gentleman had dropped on the floor people could live for a week on a shilling in those times and as the old grandmother was very poor she thought what a blessing it was that this gentleman in the cocked hat should have come in and got fairy and brownie to sing him ding dong dell on the following saturday the grandmother went out again to the forest to gather sticks and the two little sisters remained at home fairy was at the window looking up and down the road when she saw the old gentleman in the red coat and cocked hat coming towards the house well my dear said he nodding to her will you let me in to-day oh yes sir answered fairy and we will sing you four-and-twenty blackbirds baked in a pie if you like it 
thank you dear said he walking in but i think ding dong dell the finest song that ever was made and we will have that first if you please he sat down took off his cocked hat made fairy sing in his right ear and brownie in his left and when the song was ended and they wanted to have the four-and-twenty blackbirds baked in a pie he begged for ding dong dell over again for as he said the more he heard that noble song the better he liked it they were beginning it for the seventh time when the door opened and their grandmother came in with a bundle of sticks in her arm the old gentleman then started up in a mighty hurry and dropped another shilling as he walked out of the house brownie picked it up and ran after him but he did not even look round at her keep it keep it said he and he was gone and behind the ferns in no time well this shilling lasted another week and when saturday came round the grandmother went again to the forest to gather sticks and the old gentleman came and had ding dong dell sung to him by the two little sisters and everything happened exactly as it had happened before with this difference that it was the grandmother who ran after him with the shilling and that being rather lame she was only just in time to see his cocked hat disappear behind the ferns she went on thinking she would surely find him but when she too got behind the ferns all she saw was a molehill now who can this little gentleman in the red coat be and where does he come from and where does he go to thought the grandmother i shall stay within next saturday and watch him instead of going out to gather sticks as usual the old woman remained at home on the next saturday but though both fairy and brownie had their heads out of the window and sang ding dong dell and looked up and down the road for the old gentleman he never came near the cottage the grandmother got tired of waiting for him and went out towards dusk she was scarcely gone when in he walked looking in a great hurry come my dears said he to the children make haste and sing for i am ever so late fairy and brownie who were very good-natured began singing at once but at the end of five minutes he started up and said that would do for to-day and he had dropped the shilling and was gone in a moment matters went on so for a long time the grandmother seeing it was no use to stay at home and watch the old gentleman went out every saturday he came quite regularly to hear ding dong dell sung and dropped a shilling as a matter of course and walked away and vanished behind the ferns just as he had done the first time one saturday as the old grandmother was coming in and the old gentleman was going out he said to fairy and brownie well dears i shall come and hear ding dong dell sung for the last time next saturday and so what shall i bring you before the grandmother had time to put in a word both fairy and brownie had answered oh please will you bring us a bird very well said he you shall have don't forget me and off he was and behind the ferns in no time the grandmother was very angry that fairy and brownie had asked for nothing better than a bird you foolish children she said what shall we do with a bird feed it when we cannot feed ourselves and then how shall we get on without the old gentleman's shilling since he means to come no more if you had sung something else to him besides that stupid ding-dong dell he would never have left off coming i am sure she scolded them both till fairy and brownie began to cry and declared that they had sung ding-dong dell because the old gentleman would hear nothing else and he shut his eyes and purred all the time they sang it and they were sure they were not to blame well said the grandmother what is done is done but what you have to do is this when that little red coat goes away next saturday follow him as fast as you can and see where he goes to when he gets behind the ferns if you can find out where he lives he may take you to sing to him again fairy and brownie both promised to do this the old gentleman came on the saturday and they sang to him and as he was going away 
he took a little silver cage with a green bird in it out of his pocket and said good-bye my dears here is don't forget me and he was gone in no time fairy and brownie followed him out and as he never looked round they were almost as soon behind the ferns as he was they saw him walking very fast to a broad and handsome gate which stood wide open showing them a beautiful garden full of roses and beyond it a splendid palace all glittering in the sun i suppose he lives here said fairy to brownie and they followed him in no sooner had they passed the gate than the old gentleman looked round and nodded to them oh fairy and brownie said he here you are come to see me i thought you would well my dears your room is ready and luncheon is waiting he took them at once to the palace then up to a pretty room with two little beds in it and on each bed there was a pretty little frock ready the blue one was for fairy and brownie had the pink one after that they went to another room where a table was set out with cakes sweets and all sorts of good things the old gentleman bade the little sisters take what they liked and eat as much as they pleased when they had done he made them sing to him and after that he took them to a room full of playthings where he left them now this old gentleman was prime minister to the king of the fairies and his name was snip the beautiful palace he had taken fairy and brownie to was the palace of the king and queen and it was in fairyland there was nothing snip liked so well as hearing little children sing and he went out in the world every saturday for that purpose till the king who wanted him for state business would not let him out any more you may think therefore how glad snip was to keep fairy and brownie when they followed him he was very kind to them and gave them the best of everything they had all sorts of dainty things to eat and the most beautiful clothes to wear and the handsomest of playthings to play with and all they had to do was to sing ding dong dell to him every day sometimes they got tired of this and cried and asked to go home to granny but snip gave them a cake or a doll or a new frock and they were comforted no one in the palace knew anything about all this but the king and queen of the fairies soon perceived that the prime minister who dined at the royal table was always in a great hurry to go to his own apartment immediately after luncheon snip once said the king what are you going away for in such haste may it please your majesty answered snip looking mysterious i know that your majesty's enemies are plotting against you so i go and counterplot in my room the king nodded and said quite right and that was all the king had a little fairy page called pop who was always making mischief as he once passed by the door of snip he heard him talking to fairy and brownie pop was too short to look through the keyhole and see who was within but he ran and told the king that the prime minister had strangers with him snip is a traitor said the king to the queen i must see about it the king went at once to the door of snip's room and wishing to take the prime minister in the act whatever he might be doing he first peeped through the keyhole what should he see but snip seated in an armchair with his eyes shut and his hands folded a little fair girl standing on one side of him and a little dark girl on the other now my dears you may begin said snip ding dong dell sang fairy in his right ear pussy cats in the well sang brownie in his left ear and so on till the song was ended and all the time snip kept his eyes shut and purred like a cat they were going to begin over again when the king touched the lock with the fairy ring on his forefinger at once the door flew wide open snip started up in a fright and fairy and brownie went and hid behind his big chair well sir said the king of the fairies looking very sternly at snip and speaking in a very deep voice is that your counterplotting having ding dong dell sung to you by two mortals don't you know that i have forbidden all such intercourse with human beings since we had so much trouble with red cap may it please your majesty replied snip who was himself again i do it to clear my ideas and for the good of your kingdom 
your majesty knows that we fairies get cobweb on the brain now to hear a song sung by human beings who as every one knows never have cobwebs of any kind is the finest thing in the world for that complaint your majesty cannot imagine how clear one's ideas begin to get when one hears ding dong dell but when it comes to johnny trout one feels as bright as bright can be indeed said the king i must try that give me the chair and you little things come and sing to me directly it took some coaxing to make fairy and brownie sing to the king of the fairies but at length they did so and he liked it amazingly i declare my ideas are getting clearer and clearer said the king i must hear that wonderful song every day ding dong dell beautiful beautiful and pussy-cats in the well said snip oh that is fine said the king and johnny trout said snip oh that beats all said the king but snip we will keep this to ourselves we will not tell the queen about it when he had heard ding dong dell sung for ever so long the king of the fairies went and told the queen that pop was a little impostor and that snip was a great statesman well but what about your enemies and the plotting and counter-plotting said the queen my dear answered the king these are state matters with which ladies have nothing to do the queen was very much affronted at this and would not look at either snip or the king for ever so long after a time however she thought she would like to know what it was that kept them closeted together every day and so one afternoon she went to snip's door and listened to what was going on within the king was scolding snip and talking so loud that the queen could hear every word i tell you sir he was saying it is my turn to hear ding dong dell how dare you keep your sovereign waiting you rebel but snip answered quite coolly may it please your majesty i brought fairy and brownie here and though i may lend them to you they are mine for all that no we are not cried fairy and brownie we are grannies and we want to go away and we will not sing any more for you you bad ugly little men here was a fine thing two puny human beings calling the king of the fairies and his prime minister bad ugly little men snip you are a traitor cried the king in a rage you set these little creatures against me come here and sing to me directly he said to fairy and you come and sing to me said snip to brownie when the queen heard about singing she looked through the keyhole she saw the king sitting in a chair fairy singing to him and he purring like a cat with his eyes shut and snip sitting in another chair with brownie singing to him and he was purring louder than the king when the queen had looked long enough she went away presently she met the king and his minister who had made it up and were going out riding together she asked what they had been doing in snip's room my dear answered the king i have already told you that these are state matters not fit for ladies oh very well said the queen but as soon as they were gone she went up to snip's room and touched the lock with the fairy ring on her forefinger the door flew open and the queen found fairy and brownie crying together in a corner of the room they stopped when the queen of the fairies came in for never before had they seen so beautiful a lady and one so finely dressed too all in gold and silver with a crown of diamonds on her head who are you asked the queen who brought you here and what are you crying for i am fairy and this is brownie answered fairy and we came here after an ugly little black man because granny bade us and the ugly little black man makes us sing to him and we want to go home to granny very well said the queen but as you did not come here from naughtiness but because you were bid you must see my garden first she took fairy by one hand and brownie by the other and went down to the garden with them she then bade them bring her all the cobwebs they could find they did so and when she had cobwebs enough the queen took a needle out of a little housewife in her pocket and bidding the sisters mind what she was doing she began to work the cobwebs till they became the finest and most beautiful lace that had ever been seen now take a cobweb and do as i did said the queen giving each a housewife like her own fairy and brownie did as the queen told them and each worked her cobweb till it was almost as beautiful as the queen's 
now put up your housewife and let us look at my garden said the queen they went over the garden which was a most beautiful place and full of the loveliest roses and rarest flowers fairy asked if brownie and she might not take some the queen at first said no that she never allowed any one to pick the flowers of her garden then she changed her mind and told them that as they had been good children she would let them take a few fairy gathered some white roses and made a wreath of them which she put on her head and brownie picked some crimson berries that grew on a tree and threaded them into a necklace which she fastened round her neck this was scarcely done when fairy saw the gate through which they had come in standing wide open oh please said fairy to the queen may i just run out to granny i see her there beyond gathering sticks in the forest i have a hundred gardens and you have seen only one answered the queen which will you see first your granny or my other ninety-nine gardens fairy and brownie both said they would rather see granny first upon which the queen told them to go they ran out at once in the forest ever so glad to see their grandmother again but also wishing much to see the other ninety-nine gardens of the queen of the fairies we shall be back directly said fairy turning round but she stared quite amazed for lo the gate was gone and there was not a glimpse of the garden and its roses the glittering palace had vanished and they were alone in the forest with the tall ferns around them and not a sign of their grandmother far or near the two little sisters were so frightened that brownie could not help crying but fairy took her hand and said she knew the way home and that if granny was out they could sit at the door and wait till she came back they went round the ferns and followed the high road they met several people who all stared at fairy's wreath of roses and at brownie's necklace of berries till the children were ashamed and hid them in the pockets of their little pinafores for all the fine things which snip had given them were gone and they wore the shabby clothes which they had on when they followed him they came at last to the spot where their grandmother's cottage should have been but in its stead they saw a big square house with four-and-twenty windows on every side and four-and-twenty weathercocks on the roof please whose house is that asked fairy of a woman who was passing by why you silly child answered the woman where do you come from that you do not know this is the house which the queen had built for don't forget me the children were glad to hear about don't forget me for they thought that perhaps their grandmother lived there now they went and sat on the doorsteps and waited thinking she might come out to them but she did not and in her stead out walked a big servant man in livery who asked them roughly what they were doing there we are tired and we are resting said a little voice and fairy looking up saw don't forget me in his silver cage hanging out of a window then don't rest long said the big servant man as he went back into the house presently a lady's maid came out and calling the children little lazy things bade them be gone we are not lazy who we can make lace out of cobwebs said the little voice again go and say so to your lady the princess and show her this fairy seeing what don't forget me meant took out of her pocket the lace which she had worked in the garden of the queen of the fairies and gave it to the lady's maid who went in with it to her mistress the princess now this princess was so fond of lace that she spent almost all her money upon it though she could never find any to her liking but nothing could be finer than this lace made of cobweb and it was so beautiful as well that the princess declared she had never seen anything to equal it bring those wonderful little girls at once said she to the maid children said she when they stood before her did you really make this lace out of cobwebs get us some cobwebs from the garden and you will see said a little voice fairy and brownie looked up and there was don't forget me in his silver cage hanging close to them the princess sent to the garden for some cobwebs she chose the finest and gave them to fairy and brownie who each taking out her housewife at once made the most beautiful lace that could be seen and who taught you how to make lace out of cobweb and who are you asked the princess more amazed than ever a lady who lives far away taught us answered don't forget me in his cage and we are orphans will you stay with me and work lace for me asked the princess 
oh yes we will answered don't forget me if you will use us kindly the princess who never seemed to know it was don't forget me who was talking and not fairy and brownie promised to be very kind to them but she did not keep her word for the first thing she did was to have them taken to a room at the top of the house and locked up there lest they should escape and make lace out of cobwebs for some one else when fairy and brownie saw that they could not get out any more they were in great trouble don't fret said a little voice i shall keep you company they looked up and saw don't forget me in his silver cage oh don't forget me said fairy when will granny come to see us my dear answered don't forget me guess how long you have been away seven days said fairy for we left on the saturday morning and this is friday my dear replied don't forget me you have been gone seven years and your grandmother is dead fairy and brownie cried bitterly on hearing this but don't forget me did his best to comfort them he promised to stay with them and to advise them and he also told them all that had happened whilst they were in fairyland when the grandmother saw that fairy and brownie did not come back from the forest she went to look for them behind the ferns but neither there nor anywhere else did she find them she came back alone to the cottage and sitting down she began to cry don't cry granny said a little voice why who are you asked the grandmother looking around her and seeing no one i am don't forget me answered the little voice and my silver cage is just behind you i belong to fairy and brownie and you must not fret granny for they are well and happy and are busy singing ding dong dell to the old gentleman this very minute but they cannot come back for seven years and what shall i do all that time asked the poor old woman don't be afraid granny answered don't forget me but take me to-morrow to the queen granny did as she was bid she took don't forget me in his silver cage to the palace and asked to show him to the queen before her majesty could say a word the young prince who was very rude burst out laughing and said you silly old woman what does the queen want with your bird what can he do for her i can tell the queen that you broke her fan yesterday said don't forget me the young prince was quite frightened when he heard this little bird telling what he had done but the queen was both surprised and delighted you wonderful bird said she you must come and live in my palace and talk to me every day but don't forget me said he could not do that on any account however if the queen would build him a house to his liking with a few other things he should tell her of he should not mind staying in it and letting her come and talk to him every morning the queen agreed to everything for with such a bird as don't forget me to advise her she knew she could do without her ministers who were rather troublesome about that time the first thing don't forget me asked for was that the queen should build him a house with twenty-four windows on every side and twenty-four weathercocks on the roof and that this house should be on the spot where the old grandmother's cottage stood the next thing don't forget me asked for was a large garden with trees and flowers and last of all that his granny should take care of him and have a set of servants under her to keep everything nice and in order all this the queen did very willingly and every morning she went and had a long conversation with don't forget me who told her all she was to do and who made quite a great queen of her when don't forget me had been a year in his new house poor old granny died and he told the queen she must find him a princess to take care of him the queen had some trouble in getting him a princess to his liking but she did find one at last that suited him and matters went on very comfortably till the queen died too and the young prince reigned in her stead the new king would have nothing to say to don't forget me whom he hated but at the same time he feared him too much to do anything against him so don't forget me lived in his house with the princess till fairy and brownie came back from fairyland the princess was very much surprised to find that instead of staying in the drawing-room with her don't forget me would now be in the room at the top of the house with the two little girls he told her that he wanted to see them making lace out of cobwebs and as after all he was the master of the house there was no gainsaying him he was so kind to fairy and brownie that they did not mind being locked up for don't forget me told them the most beautiful fairy tales and he taught them ever so many things as well and the two sisters were as happy as the day was long till they grew up to be beautiful young women 
all these years they spent in making lace out of cobwebs till there was scarcely a cobweb to be found in field or garden and spiders had to be reared like silkworms their lace was the finest and the rarest to be seen and the princess was as proud as could be of the handsome things she had but she had nothing so handsome as the robe and veil which each of the sisters made for her own wedding day by the advice of don't forget me but don't forget me once said fairy who will ever come up here to marry us some one will come by and by answered don't forget me do as i bid you the princess had two sons who had gone off travelling to see the world the very day before that on which fairy and brownie left fairyland these two young princes had many strange adventures and saw many wonderful things but they had never seen anything more wonderful than don't forget me and when they came back the first thing they asked of their mother was where is don't forget me he is busy answered the princess you cannot see him to-day besides he does not like company any longer the princes were sorry to hear this for don't forget me had been very kind to them formerly and he had told them all about fairy and brownie and how they were to come back from fairyland when their seven years were out i shall marry fairy had said the elder one of the two princes i like her best and i shall marry brownie said his brother i like her best very well said don't forget me but you must go and travel first and by the time you are home again fairy and brownie will be here the young princes did as don't forget me bade them and when they came back and were told they could not see him the next question they put was have not fairy and brownie left fairyland yet but their mother did not even know what they meant for she had never heard of fairy and brownie the princes had been home three days and they were wondering to each other in what part of the house don't forget me was to be found when as they were walking in the garden they heard him talking to fairy and brownie who had left the window of their room open oh don't forget me where are you cried the princes from below come up to the top of the house he answered in his little clear voice which could be heard ever so far and open the first door you see and you will find me there the princes did as don't forget me told them they went up to the top of the house and opened the first door they saw for though the princess had locked the door she had forgotten to take the key when the princes entered the room they looked for don't forget me but instead of him they saw two beautiful girls one fair and one dark who were making lace out of cobwebs at first they were both so much amazed that they could not say one word but at length the elder one of the two princes looking at fairy said who are you and where do you come from i am fairy she answered that is my sister brownie and we come from fairyland then if you are fairy said the prince don't forget me has surely told you that you are to marry me and that brownie is to marry my brother there yes said don't forget me in his cage i have told them all that and their wedding dresses are ready but you must go and ask the princess for her consent the princes lost no time in going to their mother and telling her that they had found fairy and brownie and wished to marry them very well said the princess but if you do marry them i must have don't forget me when the princes went back and told fairy and brownie this the two sisters cried out that they liked the princes very much but that they could never part with don't forget me who had been so good to them all these years do as i bid you said don't forget me who had been listening to all of this and tell the princes that you will not give me up till you are married and that then you must open my cage take me out and stroke me three times and kiss me twice before you put me on her hand fairy and brownie who knew how wise don't forget me was did as he bade them and the princess was so glad to get this wonderful bird that she made her sons marry the two sisters the very next morning fairy and brownie put on their beautiful lace robes and veils and fairy's wreath of roses which she had kept all these years turned out to be diamonds and brownie's necklace of berries to be rubies and the two brides looked so beautiful and so good that every one said how happy the princess ought to be to have got such wives for her sons the princess said she was very glad but to say the truth it was because she was to get don't forget me that she was so pleased she asked for him as soon as the wedding was over the cage was brought down to the drawing-room and when the princess had ordered all the doors and windows to be shut fairy and brownie opened the cage and took out don't forget me each stroked him three times and kissed him twice then both put him on the princess's hand now i have you said she but even as she spoke all the doors and windows flew wide open good-bye said don't forget me 
and off and away he flew to fairyland where he has remained ever since and all that the princess had of him was his silver cage she was in great trouble at first but fairy and brownie comforted her and were very good and kind and they were all very happy together till they died End of section nine section ten of the pearl fountain and other fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the pearl fountain and other fairy tales by bridget and julia cavanagh batty there were three princesses once who were very beautiful and very proud each princess built herself a palace with a turret to it when the turrets were nearly finished the princesses having heard of the three silver bells of fairyland wished to have them to roof their turrets with they sent out a proclamation offering to marry the kings who would get the bells for them no kings however caring to make the attempt the princesses said they would take up with princes when this too failed they sent out a third proclamation saying they would marry the men who brought them the bells no matter who and what they might be upon this a great many young men set off for fairyland and tried to get in and bring back the bells in order to marry the princesses but they all failed no doubt for not one of them ever appeared again so the princesses remained unmarried and the turrets unroofed and all on account of the three silver bells of fairyland well about this very same time there lived a poor woodcutter and his wife who had three sons the first was big billy the second was bigger billy and the third was biggest billy when the first billy was born the woodcutter said what a fine child when the second billy came the woodcutter said that child is very large but when he saw the third billy the poor woodcutter cried out this is a giant how shall i ever feed him and his brothers indeed the three boys grew up so tall so stout and so large that every one called them the giants and they were as awkward and as ungainly as they were big they were good for nothing said their father but to mar his work fill the place and eat him out of house and home there were a great many bats in the old tower and looking at them the woodcutter used to say i would rather have a bat for a child than another billy the tower stood on the borders of a forest which was close to fairyland the fairies thought they would give the woodcutter his wish and the next child his wife had instead of being a girl was the prettiest little bat in the world the woodcutter was very angry at first but his wife said to him i wonder at you bats are dear little things to begin with and this is the dearest little bat i ever saw besides you will see how nice it will look when i have dressed it the woodcutter's wife made her little bat a pair of red mittens and a pair of red stockings and when she had them on she looked so well and so pretty in them that her father began to like her the giants too were very fond of batty and helped to nurse her until she was strong enough to fly she too was very fond of them and would hang from them when she wanted a nod in the daytime or wheel about their heads of an evening but after all there was nothing she liked so well as sleeping in the old tower all day and flitting about it at night she got on very well with the other bats for though they were all much older than she was they thought a great deal of her on account of her red mittens the woodcutter liked batty chiefly because she gave him no trouble and cost him nothing but the three poor billies he hated more and more they are good for nothing but to sleep eat and drink he would say if they had any spirit they would never stay here if they can do nothing else can't they go for the three silver bells of fairyland but if they do i shall never see them again said the woodcutter's wife crying batty who was hanging by her heels in a dark corner of the room heard all this and wondered what it meant mother said she as soon as her father was out what are the three silver bells of fairyland and why does father want my brothers to go for them her mother then told her the story of the three princesses who had offered to marry the young men who would bring them back the bells with which they wished to roof their turrets but if my billies go to fairyland said the woodcutter's wife i know i shall never see them again do not fret mother said batty if my brothers go to fairyland i shall go with them and bring them safe home 
this comforted the woodcutter's wife a little for she knew that batty was very clever and could take good care of the giants batty went at once to an old bat who lived in the tower and asked her how she was to go to fairyland it is the easiest thing in the world answered the old bat wait till the moon is up get on a moonbeam and it will take you straight to fairyland batty did as the old bat told her she waited till the moon was up got on a moonbeam and soon found herself in fairyland close to the king's palace she saw the three silver bells in a belfry shining in the moonlight and she was flitting about them when the fairy whose business it was to watch the bells cried out who goes there little batty said she what brings you here i came to see the silver bells that's all very well said the fairy but the king must have a look at you he took batty before the king and the queen of the fairies who as soon as they saw her cried out why that is little batty we know her by her red mittens well batty so you have come to see fairyland and what do you think of it i think i never saw so fine a place said batty but may it please your majesties to tell me what is the use of these silver bells up in the belfry these bells said the king are to waken us in the morning to call us to dinner at noon and to send us to sleep at night would you like the queen to let you have a look at them batty batty answered that she would very much like to see the bells so the queen took her up to the belfry showed her the bells and then said i think you had better go now batty we like you very well but we want no strangers here come get up on the moonbeam and be off batty got up on the moonbeam and she was at home in the old tower long before day no one asked her where she had been and batty said nothing about it the older the giants grew the more they slept ate and drank and the more their father disliked them at length he told them one evening that they must go out into the world and seek their fortunes there how are we to seek our fortunes asked the three billies go to fairyland get the three silver bells and marry the three princesses answered their father and he turned them out of the tower and locked the door upon them without even letting them bid their mother good-bye do not fret mother said little batty flying out of the window after her brothers i shall bring them safe home batty said big billy do you know the way to fairyland it is up a moonbeam answered batty but you are all three are too big to get up on a moonbeam you must let me go there alone and wait here in the forest till i come back the giants agreed to this batty got up on a moonbeam and went off to fairyland whilst they stayed in the forest and went to sleep this they did standing each leaning against a tree for as their father had no beds large enough for them he had accustomed them to sleep so resting against the wall when batty got off the moonbeam this time she found that she was close to the moon she thought that it looked very dull i must see what is the matter with that moon said she to herself she opened it looked in and saw that it was sadly in want of cleaning well i am sure thought batty i wonder at the fairies i do to keep their moon so untidy she shut up the moon again and went to the king's palace she peeped in at the window of a room in which the king and the queen were talking together and heard what they were saying fairies are such fickle creatures that they are always changing everything and one of their great fancies is to widen or to narrow fairyland as their whim may be now the king wanted fairyland to be widened and the queen wanted it to be narrowed that very night for it is only at night when the moon is down that the fairies can do this and that was what they were talking about fairyland is already too large as it is said the queen the fairies are always gadding about i shall not widen it much said the king i shall only take in the big oak in the forest to pass a review under it and when the review is over we can narrow fairyland back again and put the big oak out to-morrow night as soon as the moon is down the queen agreed to this and batty having heard enough got up on the moonbeam again and went off to the forest she woke her brothers and making them stand against the great oak tree she bade them wait there till they found themselves in fairyland and mind said batty that you do not stir hand or foot till you hear the three silver bells tinkle for once it is day the fairies cannot turn you out till night comes round again the three billies who knew how wise batty was promised to obey her and in order not to be tempted to leave the great oak tree they went fast asleep as soon as they stood leaning against it the moment the silver bells rang 
the king of the fairies went to look at the tree and the queen went with him when they saw the three giants standing against the oak and still fast asleep they were amazed and disgusted they did not know what to do with such big creatures and they went home to the palace to consult together on the matter that comes of taking in the great oak said the queen never mind the great oak now said the king but since we cannot turn these monsters out before night what are we to do with them in the meanwhile the queen said one thing and the king said another thing and they were beginning to quarrel when batty who was flitting near the window put in her word if you please those are my three brothers said batty and you can make them very useful if you like and pray who are you asked the queen if you please i am little batty then show me your red mittens batty showed her red mittens and the queen was satisfied still she said that is all very well batty but your brothers are too big to be of any use to us if you please said batty i have seen that fairyland is rather untidy and my brothers could clean it up for you in no time besides you have been taking in a great many insects with the oak ants caterpillars and the like and my brothers will catch and destroy them every one the king and queen did not much like that but as they could not turn out the giants till it was night again they agreed to make them useful for that day when the bells had just done ringing the giants awoke batty took them at once to the king who set them to work and be quick about it too said the king for you have only this day to do it in out of fairyland you go to-night the three billies began cleaning up fairyland and hunting all the ants and caterpillars that had come in with the great oak but when the king saw the clumsy way they set about it he cried out stop stop you are rooting up all the trees and treading on all the fences that will never do then he called batty and scolded her finally for all the mischief her brothers were doing poor batty went off to the three giants but she found that if the king was not pleased with them they were not pleased with the king for the moment they saw her they cried out batty we are starving the king gives us nothing to eat but honey and dew that will never do for us out of fairyland we go to-night ah but think of the silver bells said batty we do not care about the silver bells answered the giants we want to eat would you like fish asked batty the giants answered they would like anything that was not honey and dew but that eat they must batty went back to the king may it please your majesty said she i can see that the large fish pond in front of your palace wants cleaning my brothers could clean it for you to-day whilst you are reviewing your army under the big oak tree i don't know that the pond wants cleaning said the king yes it does said the queen and batty's brothers will do it beautifully so off the king and the queen went to the review and whilst they were away the three billies cleaned the pond and ate all the fish well have you had enough asked batty enough said the giants we are as hungry as ever you must get us out of fairyland to-night or we shall starve outright batty batty had something to do to persuade them to try fairyland for one night more and when they had agreed to stay the king came back saw that his fish was gone and called batty to give her another scolding batty begged his pardon said her brothers were very hungry and promised that they would never do it again of course not said the king all the fish is eaten bid your brothers not stir from the oak tree for out of fairyland they go with it to-night that is a pity replied batty for if my brothers go i must go too yet i see the moon is very dull here and i could clean it up for you if you gave me something handsome dear me said the queen clean the moon up how nice that would be the moon is dull as batty says and we can scarcely see to dance at night and how will you clean the moon batty batty said she would rather not tell but she knew she could do it if she got something handsome something to take away out of fairyland as a keepsake said batty the queen was mad for getting the moon clean and she persuaded the king into having it done that very night she also promised batty to let her take away whatever she pleased out of fairyland as soon as it was night batty flew up to the moon opened it got in and cleaned it thoroughly with her wings till it was as bright as bright could be and all the fairies who were looking on below clapped their hands they were so glad to see the moon shine as it had never shone before when the moon was quite clean batty came down to the king and the queen of the fairies and dropping them a curtsy she said please have i cleaned the moon to your liking 
you have cleaned it beautifully said they and now make haste and mention the keepsake you wish for we like you very well batty but we shall narrow fairyland as soon as the moon is down and the big oak and your brothers must all be back in the forest by peep of day then please answered batty i will have the three silver bells in the belfry above the palace the bells our bells cried the king and the queen why batty don't you know that we can neither waken in the morning nor eat at noon nor sleep at night if we do not hear our bells ask for something else batty said they had promised her what she liked that she liked the bells and nothing but the bells would she have nonsense said the king and the queen we cannot do without our bells so you must think of something else that we can give you batty with that they went off to dance by the light of the moon which batty had cleaned so well all the fairies young and old went after them and the fairy who watched the bells went to dance with the rest batty flew at once to the great oak tree and bade big billy come with her to the palace when they were there batty got up into one of the bells hung from the clapper so that it should make no noise then said big billy take down that bell put it on wrap it round you walk with it to the great oak tree stay there and do not stir big billy did as he was bid he stood on tiptoe took down the bell put it on rolled himself well into it then walked to the great oak tree and stood there as quiet as any mouse batty then got out of the bell took bigger billy to the palace and hanging from the clapper of the second bell she made him take it down this he did quite easily being taller than his brother bigger billy having put on the bell wrapped himself well in it walked off with it to the great oak tree and stood there as quiet as any mouse when this was done batty and biggest billy went for the third bell which he picked up he was so tall he put it on wrapped himself in it took it to the great oak tree and stayed there as quiet as any mouse whilst batty flitted about to see that all was right the giants slept till sunrise then they awoke and called out batty are we out of fairyland and can we take off our bells we are so hungry you are out of fairyland answered batty but you must not think of eating yet you must keep on the bells and walk straight on till you come to the palaces of the princesses you cannot miss the way the bells know all about it as soon as you are married to the princesses you may roof the turrets with the bells but mind you do not roof the turrets first and now i shall go and take a nod somewhere for i cannot bear daylight and i feel very sleepy the giants did as batty bade them they walked straight on and never took off the bells till they came to the palaces of the three princesses who nearly went wild with joy when they saw the silver bells they had wished for so long oh you dear good giants they cried what shall we do for you the three billies answered in a breath give us something to eat we come from fairyland where all we had was honey and dew and a little fish poor fellow said the three princesses you shall have plenty to eat but will you not roof our turrets with the bells whilst your dinner is getting ready the three giants were very good-natured and they did as the princesses bade them they roofed the turrets with the bells then sat down to dinner when dinner was over and they had eaten enough they asked the princesses to marry them but the princesses only laughed at them marry you said they who ever heard of princesses marrying giants no no but if you will stay and watch the bells we will give you plenty to eat and that will do very well for you the giants were rather vexed at being tricked but they were very easy giants and they did not know what to do so they agreed to stay and watch the bells when batty had taken a long sleep she thought she would like to know how her brothers were getting on so she flew and flew till she came to the three palaces and there she found the three billies not married to the princesses but each sitting in a turret and each watching a bell oh that's the way the princesses keep their word is it said batty well i shall soon settle that up she got on a moonbeam for it was a fine moonlight night and off she went to fairyland she found the king and the queen and all the fairies in such a commotion as had never been for the loss of the three silver bells as soon as they saw her they all cried out oh batty batty what have you done you have taken our bells and we can neither waken nor eat nor sleep till we get them back again only tell us where our bells are batty and you shall have three wishes from us will you be a beautiful girl batty thank you answered batty but i like flitting about at night and hanging from my heels in the day 
and if I were a beautiful girl I could not do that, so I think I shall stay as I am if you please. Then what will you have, Batty, to tell us where the bells are? cried all the fairies. Well, said Batty, my brothers are very fine men, but they are rather big. I should like them to be shorter. Done, cried all the fairies, and now where are the bells? Wait a bit, said Batty, my brothers are very good-natured, but they are very stupid. I should like them to be clever. The fairies again cried, Done, and asked Batty what more she would have to tell them where the bells were. I shall think it over, said Batty. As to the bells, they are roofing the three turrets of the three palaces belonging to the three princesses who were to marry my three brothers, but would not. When the fairies heard this, they were as wild with joy as the princesses had been when they got the bells, and as the moon was down, they widened fairyland at once, and the bells, the palaces, the princesses, and the three billies were all in before you could have said Jack Robinson. I declare, said Batty to her brothers, you are no longer giants, but as handsome, well-sized, and clever-looking men as I ever saw. Take off these bells and put them back in the belfry of my palace, said the king of the fairies. Yes, and we will keep the palaces lest any one should be tempted to steal our bells again, said the queen. Just so, said the king, and since the princesses were so fond of our bells, why they shall stay and ring them for us. When the princesses heard they were to remain in fairyland for ever and ring the bells there, they cried and wrung their hands and were distracted with grief and begged very hard to be allowed to go back to the world again. No, we cannot let you go, said the king, and indeed I shall keep Batty and her brothers too. Batty will clean the moon for us when it gets dull again, and her brothers are so clever now that they will be quite useful. Stop a bit, cried Batty. You owe me a wish yet for telling you where the bells were. Well, then please to let my brothers and me out of fairyland. Oh, please take us with you, cried the three princesses to the three giants. Only get us out of fairyland and we will marry you directly. But it was too late. Done, had cried all the fairies, and in a moment Batty and her brothers were in the old tower again. The woodcutter and his wife were both as glad as glad could be to see their children. I knew traveling would do you good, said their father to the three billies and indeed the brothers were so clever now that they got on famously and became great men in no time. Batty, too, was very happy, but she had her wish and remained Batty all the days of her life. End of section 10section 11 of the pearl fountain and other fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phone the pearl fountain and other fairy tales by bridget and julia cavanaugh featherhead prince crystal and princess crystal his wife were a great prince and princess they were very fond of one another, but could never be of the same mind. For Prince Crystal was all about soldiering, drilling, and fighting, and Princess Crystal was all for fiddling, dancing, and merrymaking. When their only child, a boy, was born, they both declared he was the loveliest of babies, but could not agree at all about the name they should give him. "'That baby have a fairy godmother,' said the old king, "'and she will settle that matter.' The very thing, said Prince Crystal. We will ask Poppy to name the child. Not Poppy, said the princess. She is spiteful. Let us go to Fancy Tansy. But Prince Crystal said that Fancy Tansy was stingy, and that Poppy was generous when she was in a good humour. And if we take Baby with us, said the prince, she will not only give him a name, but present him with some fairy gift or other. The princess still wanted to have Fancy Tansy for the child's godmother, but the old king thought a fairy gift was worth having, and Prince Crystal had his way. The prince and princess found Poppy at home, but very much out of temper. The cat had got into her study, and spilt a fairy wash, which had been three hundred years in making, and which would have been the finest thing in the world for tan and freckles in two hundred years more. Well, said she quite crossly, when she saw the prince and princess and the baby. What do you want, and what have you got there? Prince Crystal told her what brought them, 
and asked her so politely to give a name to baby that poppy became more gracious and answered quite kindly come with me and i will give baby a name and something along with it she took them to the room in which she kept her fairy gifts they were very valuable but not all pretty to look at and princess crystal was quite disappointed as she saw them these are not things for babies my dear said poppy indeed i have only three gifts left which would do for your boy this pair of boots this sword and this cap you may take which you like best the boots were scarlet and very pretty the sword had a gold scabbard enameled with green and the cap was the loveliest blue satin cap that had ever been seen and though they were all the size just fit for a baby they were to grow with him and last him his life said poppy prince crystal looked at the sword i shall take that said he who ever heard of a sword for a baby cried the princess besides the cap is much prettier have the boots said poppy why so asked the prince never mind have the boots when the prince and princess heard poppy advising them to take the boots they made sure this must be the worst gift of the three and the prince wanted the sword and the princess the cap more than ever they nearly quarrelled about it but princess crystal at last won the day and the blue satin cap was put on baby's head fairy poppy was very much displeased that her advice had not been taken but she pretended not to care and as they were going away she took a white feather stuck it in the baby's cap and said there now you have had your way and much good may it do you the prince and princess were scarcely out of the fairy's palace when they remembered that poppy had not named the child after all she was such a touchy fairy and so apt to take offence that they did not venture to go back to her but they began quarrelling as usual each blaming the other for having forgotten the very thing they came for it is all on account of that blue cap and feather said the prince i shall never call baby anything but featherhead well answered the princess who was so pleased with the cap that she cared about nothing else i think featherhead is as good a name as any the old king was delighted with the cap and he agreed with princess crystal that it was most becoming to baby indeed they both thought that he looked too well with it ever to take it off so baby kept his cap on night and day for being a fairy cap it always looked quite fresh and new featherhead grew up to be a very handsome and clever young prince but his temper was like the feather in his cap whichever way the wind blew went featherhead he could never stay long at one thing and when a fancy crossed his mind he thought of nothing else however wild and foolish it might be when he shook his hat off to have his hair combed and brushed featherhead became so sensible that no one could believe he was the same prince but the moment his cap was on again featherhead became as wild as ever the worst of it was that having always heard his mother say he never looked so handsome as when he wore his cap he could not bear to have it off his head and unless in very hot weather he actually slept in it the old king and prince crystal died the same year and featherhead became king when he was just twenty princess crystal at once went to see fancy tansy who was her own godmother and begged of her to give the young king some good advice my son is the best the handsomest and the cleverest king said she but he is always doing the most foolish things and getting into trouble if i say a word to him he laughs and shakes his white feather at me and looks so handsome that i forget what i meant to say and if anyone else ventures to advise or remonstrate hold your tongue says featherhead the moment he hears a word he does not like i know said fancy tansy nodding it is all poppy's doing my dear however i shall look after him fancy tansy is coming to see you said princess crystal to featherhead when she came home mind you are civil to her and featherhead who was a good-natured young king promised to be very polite 
he was alone in his room one day when the window flew open and in whisked fancy tansy in a little tortoise shell car drawn by two blue griffins the car being a fairy like its owner immediately became so small that on alighting fancy tansy put it on the table and the griffins fairies too who were a sort of pony griffin and remarkably diminutive got under the sofa and then stared at featherhead now what are you doing said fancy tansy for the young king was sitting back in his chair his heels were on the table and he was kicking at something first with one foot then with the other don't you see answered featherhead i am kicking that sunbeam how silly you must be said fancy tansy featherhead you ought to get married featherhead did not like fancy tansy's fashion of coming in through the window he did not like being called silly and he had no wish to get married just yet but all this he could have borne if it had not been for the griffins and the way they winked at him with their little cunning black eyes that seemed to say come now no nonsense that may do for fancy tansy but it will not do for us bless you featherhead we know all about you indeed these griffins provoked the young king so much that though he went on kicking the sunbeam he also tried to get a sly kick at them featherhead said fancy tansy i see what you are at take off your cap i won't said featherhead upon which the little tortoise-shell car grew large again the griffins came out from under the sofa and fancy tansy car and griffins all whisked away through the window the next time fancy tansy came in through the window in her tortoise-shell car and griffins she found featherhead sitting back in his chair with his heels up on the table at it again said fancy tansy now what do you do that for i think you are always at it said featherhead and he was going to add that he was kicking a sunbeam when he caught the little griffin staring at him from under the sofa and their little black eyes saying as plain as plain could be come none of your nonsense fancy tansy may believe that but we know better featherhead said the fairy i have got a beautiful princess for you and you must marry her i don't mind if i do said featherhead for he thought that if he were once married fancy tansy would not come so often but when the fairy went on to say that the princess was very rich and had this thing and that thing he asked quite sharply has she got griffins four said fancy tansy then said featherhead i'll never marry her take off your cap said fancy tansy i won't answered featherhead for he saw the griffins blinking and winking at him from under the sofa and he felt so sure it was they who made all the mischief that he got quite cross featherhead said the fairy if you do not marry the princess i have got for you and if you do not take off your cap this moment you shall not see me or my griffins in a hurry so much the better cried featherhead in a rage for i am tired of being lectured and snubbed by you and your griffins and i will neither marry your princess nor take off my cap the words were scarcely out of his mouth when the window flew open and car griffins and fairy were gone featherhead never kept long of the same mind fancy tansy was scarcely out of sight when he thought he might as well have married the princess he was sorry he had not asked her name but when someone told him that ruby was the most beautiful princess living he made up his mind to marry her if she would have him princess ruby agreed to become his queen provided he came to fetch her featherhead accordingly set off with a great suite and travelled night and day till he came to the princess's country as soon as featherhead saw ruby he fell desperately in love with her and the moment she saw him in his blue satin cap with the white feather in it she declared he was the handsomest and the grandest king she had ever seen tell him to take off his cap said the princess nurse to her oh nurse answered ruby that would be a pity he looks so well in it i don't like that nurse of yours said featherhead to ruby and what are these black cats that are always after her 
for he thought the nurse's black cats looked like the blue griffins. "'Cats,' said the princess. "'Well, they are cats to be sure.' "'Are you fond of jagged hair?' she went on. "'Because I am, and oh, featherhead, I should so like a hair of your shooting.' "'Then you shall have one tomorrow,' said featherhead, who knew he was a first-rate marksman. Early the next morning, Featherhead took a gun and went out. He had not walked long in the park before a fine hare ran past him. He was taking aim when the hare said, Why, Featherhead, what do you want with that gun? Featherhead answered, I am going to shoot you and take you home to the princess. Why not catch me alive, said the hare. It will be greater fun, besides I am much handsomer alive than dead. Throw down that gun and run after me. Not that I can run, for as you see, I have a bad foot. Featherhead looked at the hare, and saw that she was limping, so throwing down his gun, he agreed to take her alive. Ah, but let us have some sport first, said the hare. To be sure, answered Featherhead, start fair. The hare began leaping on before him, and Featherhead followed her close, but somehow or other, the hare, though she limped sadly at first, limped less and less as she ran, and got farther and farther from Featherhead. "'You go too fast,' said he. "'Nonsense,' said the hare. "'Keep up with me. I am sure you can, if you try.' On hearing this, Featherhead did his best, but the faster he ran, the faster ran the hare, and the greater grew the distance between them. Featherhead became very hot, and thought he would take off his cap, which his mother had always made him fasten under his chin for fear of accidents. But when the hare saw what he was about, she protested. "'Oh, Featherhead, how can you?' said she. "'Why, to see you running with that cap on your head and that white feather flying is quite a treat to me.' "'Very well,' answered Featherhead. "'I shall keep the cap on to please you, though I often wish I had never had it. It is so hot and uncomfortable at times.' but you must not run so fast. Besides, you don't limp now. It is the running, answered the hare. It has done me a world of good. I should like a run with you every morning, Featherhead. That can't be, said Featherhead. The princess must have you today. Well, then, since this is to be your last run, said the hare, let it be a good one. So off she went, like the wind, and Featherhead, though no one had ever beaten him running, was soon quite exhausted. He threw himself down panting, and had only just breath enough to say, Stop a bit, will you? I can't go on any farther. The hare replied that she did not mind taking a rest, so she too threw herself down opposite him, and lay nibbling the grass. When she had eaten enough, she asked Featherhead if he was ready, "'Oh, dear, no,' answered he. "'When the hare heard this, she rose, looked at him, "'laughed in his face, and leapt away. "'In a second she had vanished under cover, "'but Featherhead, who started up to follow her, "'could hear her laughing as she went, "'and all the echoes round said, "'Ha, ha, with the hare, and laughed at him. "'In his vexation, Featherhead tore off his cap, "'Why, what a ninny I have been,' said he, as soon as it was off his head. "'Who ever heard of running after a hare? "'No wonder she laughed at me.' "'But the moment he put on his cap again to go back to the palace, "'he began to think he had not been so foolish, after all, "'only a little unlucky. "'He was sorry, however, to disappoint the princess of her jugged hair. "'I must get her something else instead,' thought Bitterhead. Featherhead never travelled without all his cooks. The moment he reached the palace, he sent for them, and bade them tell him of some wonderful dish which he could cook himself for Princess Ruby. The head cook said one thing, and the under cook said another thing, and Featherhead disliked all their suggestions. "'Give me your cookery book,' said he to the head cook. When Featherhead had the cookery book, he read it all through till he came to the receipt for a sweet omelette. To one gill of cream put four well-beaten eggs, sugar, cinnamon, and a pinch of salt, 
fry a nice light brown on a slow fire sift fine sugar over the easiest thing in the world thought featherhead and much nicer than jugged hair i shall make it myself featherhead asked for cream egg sugar cinnamon and salt then went down to the kitchen locked himself in and set about making his omelette the great thing is to beat the eggs well thought he so he beat up his eggs and was a long time about it the shells gave him a good deal of trouble for as the book said nothing about throwing them away featherhead took care to keep them every one when he was tired beating up the eggs he fried his omelette in nice light brown as the book had said sifted fine sugar over it and sent it up to the princess with his compliments and he hoped she would like it much better than jugged hair the princess sent back her compliments to featherhead and said she was very much obliged to him but she was so vexed at not getting the hair he had promised her that she would not touch the omelette she pretended to have the toothache and told her maids of honour they might eat it if they pleased when the first maid of honour tasted the omelette a piece of eggshell cut her tongue what a delicious omelette said she when the second maid of honour tasted the omelette a bit of the eggshell got between her teeth such a flavour said she delicious a flavour said the third maid of honour why there was never such an omelette yet and she swallowed a large piece of eggshell as she spoke when princess ruby heard them all praising the omelette so much she thought she would like a bit my toothache is better said she give me just one little wee morsel to taste king featherhead's omelette but the moment the bit of omelette was in her mouth the princess gave a little scream why this omelette is made of eggshells said she has king featherhead done it to affront me I have a great mind never to look at him again. Well, it was too bad of King Featherhead, said the three maids of honour, and if your royal highness were not so sweet-tempered as you are, you would never forgive him. Hold your tongue, said the princess, and go and tell King Featherhead to come up to me. My dear, said the nurse of the princess, who sat knitting behind her chair, tell Featherhead to take off his cap. When Featherhead came, expecting to be praised for his omelette, the princess scolded him, so that he was in despair. It is all the fault of that stupid cookery book, he was going to say, when he caught the nurse's black cat peeping from under the princess's chair, and winking and blinking at him as much as to say, Come now, no nonsense. My dear Ruby, said he, how can you keep these hideous beasts about you? beasts what beasts you do not mean nurse's cats said ruby she has promised me four kittens they may be cats said featherhead but they look very like griffins and i would drown the kittens if i were you this reminded the princess that she was to tell featherhead to take off his cap but when she looked at him she found him so handsome with that blue cap and white feather that she could not make up her mind to do it i don't think i could marry him if he had not his cap on thought ruby so she said nothing about it and now thought featherhead when he and princess ruby were friends again what am i to do the hare would not wait till i caught it the stupid book never told me to throw away the eggshells what nice thing shall i get to please ruby featherhead would have liked to get that nice thing for the next day's dinner which was to be a grand one but he could neither cook it himself nor let any one cook it for him and so though he thought and thought till his head ached he found nothing for the whole of that day the next morning featherhead rode out still thinking of the nice thing he could get for the princess as he passed by a cottage he saw a beehive and it so happened that he had never seen one before what is that said featherhead to his servant a beehive your majesty and what is there inside of it asked featherhead 
the servant replied that there was honey within the beehive but he did not say that there were bees too honey said featherhead why honey is sweet stuff of course it is delicious sweet stuff i remember all about it and in a moment it flashed across his mind that princess ruby was very fond of sweet things and that he could not do better than get that beehive and set it on the table for the dessert but it must be a surprise thought featherhead not a word about it must they say till the time comes so he rode back to the palace without so much as giving the beehive another look as he was going upstairs he met princess ruby coming down and when he saw her he could not help boasting a little aha said he you still think about the jugged hare i dare say and about the sweet omelette and you do not know what a noble dish i am going to have for you and your guests by and by do not ask me what it is because i will never tell shall i guess asked ruby you may guess said featherhead but i shall never tell the princess named many things but she never thought of honey and featherhead laughed and was delighted when dinner time came round featherhead bade his servant take the cloth of gold which he kept for state occasions and follow him with four of his handsomest pages he then rode off to the cottage and bade his servant throw the cloth of gold over the beehive may it please your majesty began the man hold your tongue said featherhead do as i bid you and let my pages carry this beehive to the palace the servant did as he was bid and the pages took up the beehive and carried it off in state stop stop cried the boy running out of the cottage take that said featherhead tossing him a purse of gold and hold your tongue may it please your majesty said the boy hold your tongue said featherhead and he rode away in a great hurry and would not listen to the boy who was only going to tell him that there were neither bees nor honey in the hive which was an old one but only a set of wasps who had got in there and whom his father was going to burn out that very night i think we will not wait for dessert said featherhead to the pages take that beehive in and lay it on the table before the princess may it please your majesty said the pages hold your tongue said featherhead so the pages did as they were bid when the guests came in and saw the cloth of gold they wondered what delicious dish was under it and they all sat down expecting something they had never had before princess ruby was very impatient to know what featherhead had brought her in such state featherhead said she do get that cloth taken off if you please take off the cloth said featherhead to the pages the pages took off the cloth and the princess and the guests stared when they saw a beehive that is a beehive said featherhead to the princess i dare say you had never seen a beehive before indeed i had she answered very crossly for she was quite disappointed well i had not said featherhead and it is full of honey and you like honey i am sure yes but i don't like it out of a beehive said ruby still very cross and i do not like bees bees why these are wasps she cried as a whole swarm came out of the hive buzzing around the room settling on all the dishes and stinging the people right and left princess ruby was one of the first stung and flew out of the room screaming well there never had been at princess ruby's court anything like the disturbance there was now with these wasps everyone pushed and tumbled against everybody else and still more wasps came out of the hive buzzing and stinging till everyone fled before them and the room and the palace were full of them and featherhead was beside himself with shame and vexation he sent for his servant and threw all the blame upon him how dare you bring that beehive in here said he in a rage why did you tell me there was honey in it when it was full of wasps your majesty told me to hold my tongue answered the man besides i did not know there were wasps in the hive then the boy knew go and fetch that boy that i may have him hung cried featherhead who was still in a great passion 
The servant went and fetched the boy. "'You knew there were wasps in that hive, and you never told me,' said Featherhead to the boy. "'You shall hang for it.' "'May it please your majesty,' said the boy. "'You, you bade me hold my tongue.' "'Then I cannot hang you,' said Featherhead, "'nor the pages, for I bade them hold their tongue, "'nor myself, for I am always doing foolish things, "'and I never know why, "'and all I can do is to go and beg Ruby's pardon.' "'At first no one could tell Featherhead "'where Princess Ruby had gone to. "'At length a little page said she was in a summer-house "'that overlooked the sea at the end of the garden, "'and her nurse was with her bathing her face.' on account of all the wasps that had stung her. Featherhead went off at once to seek the princess, but the moment he entered the summer-house and she saw him, Ruby cried out, Go away! I hate you! Go away directly! But Featherhead, instead of going away, threw himself on his knees at her feet and begged her to forgive him. I tell you, I hate you and your cap and feather! said Ruby, who had a very quick temper, and in her rage she snatched the cap off his head and flung it out of the window into the sea. The moment his cap was off, Featherhead stared and burst out laughing. "'Well, there never was such a ridiculous fellow as I have been,' said he. "'But if you will forgive me this time, Ruby, I promise never to be so foolish again.' "'You may believe him, my dear,' said the nurse, who turned into Fancy Tansy, and was up in her car with the cats turned into griffins all in a moment. "'Featherhead will be very sensible now. It was all Poppy's doing. "'Poor Featherhead! Did you not know it was she who ran as the hare, and laughed at you, and enjoyed your folly, "'and that she wrote that cookery book, and kept the wasps quiet in the hive till it was on the table?' But I was your friend, Featherhead, you may tell your mother so. Now good-bye, and behave well, both of you, and Ruby has four griffins after all, Featherhead. And away she flew through the air, leaving Featherhead bareheaded, but as wise a king as ever was, and Ruby with every sting gone from her face, and the loveliest four little griffins frisking about her. My dear Ruby, said Featherhead, what beautiful little creatures these are. Oh, they are only kittens, said Ruby, but since it was all nurse's doing, I am very sorry I threw your cap into the sea, Featherhead. You do not look half so well since you are without it. I shall send a diver down for it. Featherhead was in despair when I heard her saying this, for he knew what would happen if he got the cap on again. But though the princess was obstinate, and sent ever so many divers down for the cap, and offered ever so much money to get it back again. No diver could find it for her, for when a fairy gift is lost or thrown away, it goes back to the fairy who bestowed it, and Featherhead's blue satin cap with the white feather had returned at once to its place in Poppy's palace, where it was quite ready for any one to whom the fairy might choose to give it. Featherhead, however, never had it again, he married Ruby and took her home to his kingdom, and became the wisest king of his day. When Princess Crystal saw her son come back without his cap, she was inconsolable at the loss. It was no use for Fancy Tansy to tell her how foolish Featherhead had been whilst he wore that cap. Princess Crystal would answer, That is very true, but it was the handsomest cap I ever set my eyes on, and I never saw such a feather. Ruby, too, though she was queen, and very happy with Featherhead, could not get used to him without his cap for a long time, and to the last of her days she was vexed with herself for having flung it into the sea. But Featherhead got on very well without it, and indeed he was so much afraid of getting it back again, for he knew how mischievous Fairy Poppy was, that he never wore a cap to the day of his death. End of section 11. Recording by phone. End of the Pearl Fountain and Other Fairy Tales by Bridget and Julia Cavanaugh.